<laughs> Five Country Close Up for April 15th. What we found out so far is that it's related just to that apartment and that there isn't anything that's been found so far that would have implications for the rest of the apartments. And we want to make sure that that's, that's the case. What is job satisfaction for a nurse? Um, I guess I'd have to use one word, and that's recognition. And they get job satisfaction when they achieve recognition for what they do. And that recognition comes from the patient and his family, and it comes from her peers, and it comes from the physician. It's very important that this experiment work. It's very important that we convince the Iowa Supreme Court, which has the final say in this matter, that cameras really are a friend of the judiciary, and that they fit very well into the coverage, the news coverage of judicial proceedings. Good evening, I'm Bob Pyle. I'm Twyla Young. Tonight we're going to look at some of the changes taking place in the nursing profession. And we'll find out how cameras in the courtroom worked in the recent murder trial of Lane Scott Wolf. But first, a closer look at a near tragedy and some of its implications. Bob? Last month, an explosion and fire ripped through a student housing unit at Iowa State University, seriously injuring one person and destroying the building. What caused the explosion? Is the university responsible? And are the housing units indeed safe? These questions have been posed many times since the tragic incident, and tonight we attempt to give you some of the answers. To many students on the Iowa State campus, the housing here at Pamel Court is a dream. Even though it's not fancy, it's cheap and close to campus, and that's important. Laura, first off, what do you like or don't like about living here at Pamel? Well, I like the area. I like the rent, most of all. <laughs> I think um, they're nice once you get them fixed up. And oh, it's cheap. <laughs> and, um, I don't know. It's kind of nice freedom, a little more freedom than the dorms. Well, it's, um, it's very inexpensive, and it is close to campus. It's in with walking distance. Well, for Pamel Court resident John Berg and Richard Robbins, that dream turned into a nightmare. On the afternoon of March 26, John Berg struck a match to light a cigarette. A split second later, that tiny flame of the match turned his one-bedroom apartment into an inferno. Authorities report a gas leak set off the fiery explosion, which hurtled Berg through the front door, leaving him sprawled on the front lawn in serious condition. The 23-year-old ISU student was rushed to Mary Greeley Hospital in Ames with first, second, and third-degree burns over 35% of his body. He still remains there in intensive care. 21-year-old Richard Robbins was the only other person in the fourplex at the time of the explosion. He told us that he got up to change a record when all hell broke loose. I'd been home about two hours, and uh, I got up to change a record, and all of a sudden I turned around, the wall came in on me. I heard a loud explosion, and it blew me into the bedroom, and so I ran out of the apartment as fast as I could. Looking at this burned-out hulk of a building, a person has to wonder how anybody got out alive. But both Berg and Robbins did. And now both men, along with the rest of the people that lived here, are trying to pick up the pieces. Oh, it was, it was massive. Um, I have a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And it would have taken a U-Haul to move it when I was going to move it in the first place, but I had to move it in less than two days. And in the back of a pinno, it took four or five trips. And uh, it, it really wore me out. It really disrupted school and everything like that. You know, just a big inconvenience. While residents of the fourplex were making other living arrangements, fire officials in the university began the tedious task of trying to reconstruct the circumstances surrounding the mishap. It's difficult from the standpoint that in that particular incident we had a lot of structural damage. The walls are not in position, the, uh, the ceiling is not there, and we have the roof that's sagging, and we have a lot of materials that are present that normally would not be. After weeks of investigation, Fire Chief Parks and authorities from the State Fire Marshal's office announced what they believed to be the cause of the explosion and fire. We found that a flex line that uh, comes from the space heater uh, and connects to the gas pipe within the unit had a loose connection. 
Even though Ames Fire Officials and the State Fire Marshal's Office have completed their investigation, Park says there's still some unanswered questions. Like how did the connector between the space heater and the gas line come loose in the first place? This uncertainty on the part of Chief Park's office has got the University Housing Authorities concerned. They want to make sure they won't have another explosion on their hands in the future. What we found out so far is that it's related just to that apartment and that there isn't anything that's been found so far that would have implications for the rest of the apartments. And we want to make sure that that's, that's the case. Pamel Court apartments aren't much to look at. They were constructed right after World War II to accommodate the masses of returning servicemen who wanted to go back to school. The units were never meant to be anything other than temporary housing. Well, that was over 40 years ago, and as you can see, a good number of the original units are still standing. They are many years old now, and they were not new when we put them there. They're, they're getting outdated. Uh, the city and university both feel that the incident that happened in Berg's apartment was unique to that unit and that there's no threat of a gas explosion in any of the other PAML residences. So because of this, there are no plans for a safety inspection of the other PAML units. This has got some people who live there upset. I think maybe that they should check the other units, though, and check and see if there's any leaks in those. Feel safer about the whole thing? Probably. <laughs> I think they should. I think they should. I think it's their responsibility. Even if Pamel Court Apartments were to be inspected, there is some question as to who would do it. When talking to the people who live in Pamel, a number of them felt it was the job of the Ames Fire Department to come in and make sure their units are safe. But not so. The city of Ames is not responsible for university housing. It was concluded based upon uh, decisions from this state and other states that uh, city ordinance could not be enforced against the state and that the uh, state housing law, 413, having no specific reference to the housing of the state, um, probably does not apply to the state's housing. Chapter 413 of the State Code of Iowa says that all cities over the population of 15,000 people should conduct annual safety inspections of all multiple dwellings. Almost 10% of Ames' 40,000 population lives in university housing, and a good number of that 10% live in Pamel Court. Half of Pamel's units are duplexes, and the rest, which is about 45 buildings, are fourplexes. Fourplexes, under the state code, are considered multiple dwellings. So why no city inspections? The city codes that we're working with uh, don't really apply to the university, or we're not in a position where we enforce them or could enforce them at the university. So no, I, I, I don't really have any, uh, I'm happy that the university officials are responsible for it. Since the city has no jurisdiction over the inspection of university property, who is responsible for the inspection of Iowa State's apartment units? According to the university, that's the job of the ISU maintenance people. As to how often these people inspect, well, it could be as often as every quarter or as seldom as every three to four years. I do not think that the historic track record of the city of Ames' rental housing uh, would have more inspections or better inspections than what we have. My feeling is, to date, the university's housing is inspected more often and that they would tend to be in total better condition, would be safer than all uh, rental housing in the city. Not pieces of it, but as a total. Since Chapter 413 of the state code doesn't apply to the state, lawmakers have made other provisions. Assistant State Fire Marshal Reynold Henches told us that his department is required under Chapter 100 of the state code to inspect school buildings, dormitories, and university apartments once every two years. But because of a shortage of budget and manpower, some of those buildings aren't inspected. Henches says the buildings that are usually not inspected are university apartments like Pamel. And according to Henches, his department inspects units like Pamel only upon request of the occupant. And as far as he knows, his department to this date hasn't received any inspection requests from Pamel residents. Even though biannual inspections of university-owned housing is the law, it seems the shortage of bucks is keeping the state from doing it. And because the state polices itself, who's going to come down on the state fire marshal's office for not inspecting university apartments? Since money is getting tighter, there's some question as to whether this problem will ever be remedied. So if any Pamela residents don't feel their housing is safe, right now the only way to get it inspected is by special request to the state fire marshal's office. Twyla? 
Bob, if you were to talk about to, to the personnel director of just about any hospital, that person is likely to tell you that there is a nurse shortage in this country. And if you talk to nurses, you'll probably hear a lot of reasons for that shortage. Nurses in a hospital, caring for patients. That's our traditional view of nurses. Nursing is an old profession, an established one, and we generally assume that nurses will be there when we need them. But the folks whose job it is to make sure of that are having more and more difficulty filling those positions. That's ironic in these days when so many workers are losing their jobs, but the nursing workforce is undergoing some important changes. Marilyn Molan of the University of Iowa College of Nursing says that nurses are better educated these days, both in the science of nursing and in the broader scope of human understanding. And, says Molan, the bureaucratic systems in many institutions fail to reward that increasing professionalism. She's not rewarded for the kinds of supportive measures that she's become accustomed to practicing in her educational program. The monetary reward system is no different for the baccalaureate prepared nurse than it is for the AD or diploma prepared nurse in that the reward system is based on carrying out technical kinds of things rather than on the professional decision making skills. Furthermore, the nurse is frequently exposed to rotating shifts and other kinds of um, environmental factors that are, that are not very job satisfying. And I would say that that's a big reason for the nursing shortage. Iowa Lutheran Hospital in Des Moines is one of the hospitals that faces a chronic problem of filling nursing positions, particularly the night and weekend shifts. To combat the problem, Lutheran has developed a tuition reimbursement plan to lure graduates of the Grandview College nursing program. They've designed a refresher course and buddy system to attract nurses who have not worked for several years. Perhaps most dramatic, they're advertising with billboards all over town, all in an effort to provide the hospital with a full staff. At the same time, says Lutheran's assistant director of nursing, Marcia Fox, the hospital wants to provide a measure of job satisfaction for its nurses. What is job satisfaction for a nurse? Um, I guess I'd have to use one word, and that's recognition. And they get job satisfaction when they achieve recognition for what they do. And that recognition comes from the patient and his family, and it comes from her peers, and it comes from the physician. Part of that recognition comes from being allowed to participate in the decisions about a patient's welfare and treatment, a right that has greatly expanded in the last decade. There are in certain situations. Uh, they have standing orders from physicians to initiate certain uh, treatments, uh, medications in certain areas. The intensive care area is one. Um, the emergency room that, uh, gives a nurse some latitude to begin emergency care of a trauma patient. Uh, most of the hospitals in the city have physicians, uh, staff, right in the emergency room. But the nurses know what they should do in certain instances and just initiate that while the physician is making an assessment and doing uh, some other things. Um, in obstetrics, I think the same thing is true, that they know what to do in uh, the face of certain emergencies and they initiate that treatment. At present, in the eyes of an employing institution, a nurse is a nurse. That nurse may have a diploma from a hospital course, an associate degree from a community college, or a baccalaureate degree from a university. But although the work assignments may be similar, the training is different and the expectations of the graduates are often different. Mullen says different nurses do different things, have different skills, and need recognition for their different kinds of contributions. Nursing has to reach the point as an organized group where it does recognize that there are both there there is both the need for good technicians and the need for practitioner profession, uh, pra professionals in the field and we are now still at the point where we are saying trying to say that a nurse is a nurse is a nurse and each nurse regardless of her educational preparation is um, is very proud of her professional competence and in believing that all people should be professional practitioners, we have, um, I think, a certain amount of guilt on the part of people who, who don't have a baccalaureate preparation, thinking that they're not going to be recognized as, as being good practitioners unless they are called professionals. 
And when we, when we give nurses the feeling that they're not good enough just because they have a good technical preparation, I think we're doing ourselves a real disservice. So if I had a magic wand, I'd say, I'd say let's make the separation in nursing very clear and let's accept the nurse technici technicians for what they are and let's accept the nurse professionals for what they are and allow for both to practice in the field. Some nurses have made the distinction for themselves by moving out of the institutional setting and into what is coming to be known as expanded nursing. Many of these nurses work in community health clinics, like Joan Bishop, nursing coordinator for community health support systems in Ames. Bishop performs a whole range of functions from administration and education to client counseling and health screening. Although this clinic is supervised by the State Board of Health, it employs no physicians. Its primary goal is preventative health care. It provides referral to doctors in the case of actual illness. The nurses here spend their time helping families learn how to be healthy. Once a week, the agency holds its well child clinic. On that day, children up to age 12 are seen by Jean Heft. Is Heft began her professional career as a registered nurse working a shift at the Charles City Hospital. She went on to become a doctor's office nurse, but she wanted to do more, so she went back to school and is now a pediatric nurse practitioner. It's, it's not like hospital nursing. Um, my job now is mainly... Um, it's quite involved. It, we do everything for the children. As you see here at the clinic today, it involves, I do it different aspects each time and do the complete physical exam, which most nursing wouldn't do. To you personally, what does it mean to be a nurse? Oh, it means a lot. I, I don't know. It means very much to me to be a nurse and to help. Most of the doctors are treating the, the illness. They're looking for the, the problem kid with the illness and what do I do in the medicine. They're, they're into a different um, a scope, dif different field of dynamics. Here we're into more preventive, what can I do for the family and making it easier for them on growth and development things, just what's common and what isn't, what you can expect and what this everybody goes through. Often people will ask a nurse who seeks additional skills and responsibility, why not just become a doctor? We ask each of these nurses that question and the answer was essentially the same from each one of them. And I guess the nurse that goes uh, into that role, whether it's a clinical specialist or a nurse practitioner, still sees the basis of what she does as nursing. Um, she still sees the care aspect as important to her. Um, but she has the ability to make certain assessments, to initiate uh, certain emergency care for patients. Uh, she sees that as still um, basically nursing care for the patient. Bob, the people who train nurses say that nurses are going to have to take the bad along with the good. In return for more responsibility and independence, today's nurses are having to cope with a faster pace and increased stress as an everyday part of the job. Up next, a look inside a Polk County courtroom by the way of a fledgling experiment. Mm -hmm. 